All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to BWI Talks, Island SOS, and I'm William Campbell, your host for today's presentation. This eight-part series focuses on sustainable ocean development initiatives used in various island nations around the globe, and each presentation will cover a different island and a different topic. It will highlight the unique perspective and involvement that islands have on ocean conservation, and it will showcase the different practices that islands have undertaken to safeguard their surrounding ocean. BWI appreciates the generous sponsorship of Chubb, the exclusive sponsor of this series, Island SOS aligns with Chubb's mission to promote a healthy and sustainable planet, to uh, strengthen biodiversity and the resilience of communities, and to protect against the effects of climate change. So today is the uh, third presentation in our series for this year, and uh, today we're focusing on our very own uh, local island of Bermuda with uh, the Water Start Foundation. And uh, I would like to uh, have you all join me in welcoming uh, the three uh, representatives from Water Start. We've got J.P. Skinner, the uh, director of the group. We've got Phoebe Barboza, an operations and research uh, manager, and Anne Kermode, the education officer as well. Just before we uh, get involved with their presentation and uh, listen to what they have to uh, share with us this morning, I'm just going to ask them to uh, give a little bit of a uh, bio and a blurb about themselves. So, passing over to J.P. Thanks so much, William. Um, and a huge thank you to, uh, to BUEI and Chubb for making this happen and for this opportunity. Um, I'm a professional beach bum. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here on this beautiful sunny afternoon. Uh, this is the 23rd year of Water Start being in operation. I think that basically I created the, uh, the program that I wished I could have done when I was 12 years old. Um, and uh, in launching that and getting young people out in the water, we've discovered so many wonderful spin-offs in terms of community building, sustainability, and so on. So uh, I've turned a, a teaching credential and a love of the water into my own perfect job. So I think I'm very lucky. I'm going to pass it over to Phoebe. Hello, everyone. I'm Phoebe Barboza. I'm the Research and Operations Manager for Water Start. Um, I was first introduced to Water Start as a student. So when I was 12, I was taught by JP how to dive. I worked in the BIOS labs all the way through to my master's, and I have a master's in marine biology. And what I mainly wanted to focus on is how I could bring everything I learned overseas into the community of Bermuda and continue through that um, with the missions of Water Start, and it's all aligned very, very positively, and I'm very grateful to be a part of this team. Hi, everybody. I'm Anne Kermode. Um, I'm an educator of approximately 20 years inside the classroom, and I'm thrilled to finally be working outside the classroom, which has always been my passion. And um, I followed Water Start for a long time. My children have gone through as students, and I'm just very excited to have worked for Water Start now for about a year and to be really um, investing my passion for the outdoors into my teaching practice. Thanks. Water Start has a, uh, has a presentation to share with us this morning on a shelf restoration and the work that they're doing uh, over on Burt's Island. Um, I'm going to pass the, uh, the mic over to JP and the crew and ask them to uh, take it away. And I hope you guys will uh, learn something along with us and hopefully raise some uh, interesting questions around ocean conservation and the role of Water Start uh, in providing it here in Bermuda. Wonderful, thank you so much, William. We're filling up, wonderful, come on in. <laughs> well, just while folks are taking their seats, um, the plan for this afternoon is to keep it pretty quick, um, and I promise, uh, well, Phoebe's promised to kick me in the shins if I, uh, <clears throat> if I don't take my own advice. What I'd like to do is provide a very quick overview of Water Start, so a little bit of the history, just a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to present an overview of our shellfish restoration project, kind of the high-level stuff, and then I will pass the mic over to Phoebe to talk about the science aspects. I do not have a master's in marine science or any degree in science. I'm the educated beach bum side of it, um, and she's the expert in that. And then Phoebe will in turn pass the mic over to Anne, who is a, a, a well, a, an absolutely wonderful educator and with a long history of education on the island. And, and she'll talk about the education specific aspects. And then of course, at the end, we'll turn it over to you for any questions that you may have. So what to start in a nutshell, um, our mission is maybe a little different from other uh, marine based charities on the island in that we're focused on the students. Um, and using just our incredible, beautiful marine environment as the hook. We try to get them excited about getting outdoors by presenting the beautiful ocean around us and all the opportunities to safely explore. Um, and at the same time, to sink their teeth into some really meaningful restoration projects. So the goal is to have them 
learn themselves to uh, promote their own well-being and growth, and at the same time sneakily slip in a little bit of environmental uh, awareness along the way. Um, and as the picture shows, you know, we have this incredible environment um, with shipwrecks and all kinds of exciting things to get them hooked. We started this about uh, 22 years ago in 2001. We actually launched on Burt Island, so it's wonderful to come full circle back to the island that we now call home. For 13 of those years, I was based at BIOS, um, and this was a wonderful education for me, learning a lot of marine science. We still have a wonderful close relationship with BIOS and with uh, the BZS and, of course, with Buey and all of the amazing resources in Bermuda because we've kind of become a hub for local education. So for the teenagers, and um, you know, once they're 12 and 13 and they're growing maybe a bit tired of the, the little kid camps, they're excited to go on and do something else, and we can get them a little bit of certification, some of the scuba certification, first aid and safety, and so on, and then refer them back to the other opportunities that they can have, whether that's marine science, whether that's moving on to uh, a job in tourism, say, or research, or archaeology, or any of these amazing opportunities that Bermuda, Bermuda provides. So our hope is to uh, grow as that hub and really to have every local student get that marine uh, resume underway so that by the time they're 18, they are incredibly marketable, but also incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about their own ocean home. The, the trick for us, really the holy grail, is finding meaningful projects that students can safely contribute to. So not seeing education as something that we tell them, but education is something that they do. And finding projects which engage them um, and that they can really take the lead on is, is our mission. And it's hard because I want to do it myself. You know, I want to be the one hands on. And as much as I want to, uh, you know, restore the forest on Bird Island, I have to step back and encourage the students to drive it. And it may not be perfect. Even if I did it, it wouldn't be perfect. But to let our students really take the, the lead there is the key. We've discovered a few along the way that have been just perfect for young people in Bermuda. Seagrass restoration is absolutely wonderful. Obviously, the seagrass grows in shallow bays. We don't need them to be on scuba to do most of the research there. They can snorkel. They can collect some very meaningful data. The seagrass, unfortunately, as we know, has been in decline for decades and hit a crisis point last year. So it's very, very important that people engage in this, uh, in this crisis. And for young people to be able to do something tangible, to collect data, and then to report back and publish that data um, is just so meaningful. And for them to see, you know, I'm actually contributing. This isn't an exercise. This is real world. Is, uh, is just game changing for us. Um, the shellfish mariculture is what we'll talk about in a few minutes. But we're also working on an organic garden out on the island. When we say we, I mean Anne, really. Um, woodland restoration. And, and again, this is the uh, kind of western half of our campus. We're looking at restoring a la Nonsuch Island, so a lot of the natives and endemics. Um, hopefully some mangrove restoration, we've launched that, but all sorts of tangible projects that our students can get, uh, get excited about and that they can drive. Again, it might not be perfect and it's very difficult to want to restore something according to the science and according to the best practices, but if we step in and don't let students make decisions and possibly fail, then they're not engaged and they don't learn. So this, these really are student-driven projects. So a little bit of high-level stuff on shellfish uh, restoration. We're really doing some mariculture here. And just definition-wise, this is a subset of aquaculture. So there's a lot of aquaculture that goes on around the planet. Um, a lot of this on land in big tanks, a lot of it quite scientific. Mariculture really speaks about mari ocean culture enrichment, so enriching the ocean or ocean farming. Um, and if we think about it, integrated, some say multi-trophic, mariculture, so lots of different systems working together, is very similar to the terrestrial concept of permaculture. So I'd like to just talk about permaculture a little bit, a little bit of a definition there, and then see how those concepts can be applied to the ocean in Bermuda. Um, the concept of permaculture really is, could we design systems for sustainability as opposed to systems which largely have been designed for profit or for other reasons? For example, a, uh, a farming system today is very much about generating food to generate profit as opposed to the true original definition of agriculture, which is agri-soil culture enrich. So instead of enriching the soil, agriculture now pretty much just strips all the nutrient out of the soil to sell it 
and we often end up with a degraded uh, environment. The start of permaculture was a, a guy called Bill Mollison. He was uh, studying forestry, doing his university degree, I believe a master's, and looking at ecosystems, in particular forest ecosystems, something like this. The idea, of course, Ecology 101, is that all of this free energy, the sunlight comes in, the photosynthesizers can harness that energy, and in turn power the whole system. And because there's so much free energy, we can harvest, in this case, maybe mushrooms and nuts and berries and seeds and plants. And I don't know if I want to eat that mouse, but you get the idea. So there's all sorts of things we can harvest from the system. The central premise here is that the more biodiversity, the more complex this is, the more stable it is. So if we want a farm, if we can keep it as complex as possible, as many systems, as much redundancy as possible, it's going to be stable. And then in turn, it's going to be productive. The most productive and stable ecosystems on the planet are the ones like mangroves, which uh, kind of have so much biodiversity built in that they can really, really withstand all kinds of changes and in turn be very, very productive. So Bill Mollison was studying all of this and looking at all the, the connections within the ecosystems. He graduated and didn't have a job, so he went to work on a farm, which looked like this. And he went, wait a minute. If I have just learned in my master's degree that productivity is correlated with biodiversity, why do we farm with a monoculture? Why are we doing it this way? There must be some reason. There must be some benefit to getting rid of every weed, stripping the soil bare, pumping in fossil fuel derived fertilizer, pumping water from a nearby river to make a quick profit. There must be a reason. But he said, let me, let me uh, call the bluff here. And he went and bought five acres of land in Australia that was absolutely barren, arid scrubland, and said, can I turn that into a working farm? And uh, about 10 years later, all of his neighbors were saying, how did you do that? It was incredible. Everywhere around was still brown and arid, and he had this thriving farm. He then expanded, went to 100 acres, and the science that he developed kind of went around the world. And now there are uh, stories from all around the planet of permaculture, not only restoring really degraded environments, but actually being financially and uh, food you know, productive way more than, the, than this kind of agriculture. Um, one of the examples um, is called Greening the Desert. The country of Jordan has hired this team to go out and try to restore this incredibly degraded and salt-encrusted soil, and they're doing an incredible job. And one of the ones that uh, was screened here at Bowie in, I believe it was 2018, 2019, was the biggest little farm. The absolutely wonderful story of if you design things correctly using good principles, it can be incredibly productive. So the question, of course, for us is while permaculture is spread around the planet, it's really on the terrestrial ecosystems. No one's really doing it, or very few people are doing it in the ocean. And for us, on an oceanic island, this is pretty key. So this came to a head and uh, was brought to my attention when Bren Smith visited. So this was in 2013. Bren came down from uh, New England and did a TEDx talk. And he basically uh, fired a shot at us and said, hey, this works in New England. Why aren't you guys doing this? And basically he, um, those of you who have seen, can I just see who, anyone here see that talk by Bren Smith back then, TEDx? Um, it was pretty eye-opening because he was a lobster fisherman. And as he said, he was a failing lobster fisherman. Uh, he just wasn't able to catch enough lobster to make a profit. And he said he, he decided to kind of shift his method. So he still farms lobsters on the bottom, but on the surface, he now farms giant kelp. So he makes a profit from that. And in between the giant kelp and the lobsters, he's now hanging mussel nets. He's got scallops going. He's got oysters. So he's now farming the entire water column, and he calls it 3D vertical farming. He's getting a much bigger yield. He's able to export the technology but most importantly, he's restoring the environment there as well. So in uh, it's Thimble Island Fisheries, the northern part of Long Island Sound, and he's doing really, really well. And he came down to Bermuda and said, you know, this is the new technology. This is permaculture applied to the ocean. Why don't you guys do this? And yeah, why aren't we doing this? This is kind of what we're thinking about with, um, with uh, Waterstar and with our shellfish restoration. The idea really, like permaculture, is can we design a system that mimics natural systems. So could we mimic a coral reef? Could we mimic a mangrove ecosystem and make it productive? Can we farm the ocean, but not based on those multi-combine harvesters just chewing up the earth? Could we model it on nature? And 
Brent Smith says, yes, you absolutely can in temperate water, but no one seems to be doing this in subtropical or tropical water yet. And so, well, we've got all these students and they need to ask some questions and do some higher order thinking. Um, and they get so engaged when we throw them in the water to do stuff. So can we put these things together? So I took a stab at this, and this is um, JP's really rough drawing here, but what could a temperate, sorry, a subtropical water uh, designed ecosystem look like? Well, on the bottom, you could have an element which would be, say, your mooring to hold your buoy, full of holes in which maybe lobsters live or different kinds of uh, sea creatures. We have a few on the bottom now, and they're mostly inhabited by big, uh, we call them bull grunts, but the big male blue striped grunts. Up on the surface, we could have some kind of a fad, a fish attracting device, because you need some sort of a element up there from which you could hang, say, mussel nets and oyster nets and so on. Um, could we have some kind of a crop on the surface? Giant kelp, which Bren Smith uses in uh, Thimble Island fisheries, is a cold water species. It's incredibly useful and productive, but it doesn't grow here. Could we use sargassum? Could we use some other plant that grows on the surface here? Um, what would work in the midwater column? How is this all going to work when a hurricane comes along? What are the predators going to do? Could we have this so stable that it will attract so many fish that we bring more nutrient in? It's really way more questions than we have answers to at this point. But the interesting thing for us and what we've discovered is just by hanging a few nets to start this project, the productivity of the area just measured very uh, quantita sorry, qualitatively by looking at the number of fish and the little critters has just gone through the roof. So initially, it's super, super exciting. The timing is also good because Bermuda is, um, thanks to the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Plan and the marine, marine spatial planning process that's been going on for the last couple of years, there's a real focus and a growing emphasis on mariculture and aquaculture and looking to transform some aspects of extractive fishing to productive uh, mariculture. Our goals then are, are pretty simple, really. Enhance food security. We'd love to bring back some of these uh, fairly threatened species. But if we do so, so that we can actually get an excess, then maybe just like our grand and great grandparents, we could be able to reestablish a fishery for mussels or oysters and so on. They're also a wonderful carbon sink. So the more that we can have a productive ecosystem, the more we're pulling in CO2 and combating climate change. Um, and these little critters are amazing at restoring water. A lot of places around the world use hanging nets of mussels and so on to clean the water. Each little oyster will filter about 100 gallons of salt water a day. So when we have millions of them hanging in the harbor in, uh, in mussel nets, then suddenly we're going to have you know, this huge vacuum cleaner sucking up all of the uh, excess nutrient in the harbor. So all of these are really positive benefits, but my, my kind of background is education, and I just look at this as an incredible way to get students engaged, um, and it definitely works. So I'm gonna pass it over to Phoebe um, to talk about the actual project. Thanks, Phoebe. Thank you, JP, for an awesome introduction. So I'm gonna talk about what we actually do, and really this is a high level to get you interested. I would prefer all of you guys to be out there on the island with us to actually see how to do this than to be in here showing you it. So please come out to Waterstar and see what we're doing out there. So our very initial steps are we have to somehow collect the larval species. Um, we call these spat, and we've hung spat collecting nets, which were in JP's diagram, at these four points around the island. Once we have these nets out, they are old onion bags and potato bags, um, old coffee sacks um, that allow water to come through, collect the small larval species and allow them to grow to a, um, a very small size, only about this big. Then we bring them up on our wet bench and we start beginning to sort and identify the species. Then these individuals are moved to our larger grow out nets. Now, the species on the screen right now are three main ones that we seem to be getting in all of our nets. So right at the top, we have our Atlantic pearl oyster. They have been hugely successful in our nets so far, which is awesome to see them. We start with that small, tiny one at the far side there on my fingertip. Um, and we've had them grow up to quite a few um, good centimeters long. We had a huge group measuring them the other day to see how they've been changing. 
One species we would love to have come back is the zigzag scallop. So you can see them there. That is our Bermuda scallop, which can get big enough to be eaten. We've started with some small ones, but really it's just seeing if we can even find them anymore. So it's grateful to see them in our nets. And we also get some of these rocks, the rock scallops. But along the way, when all of the students and participants out there are learning how to ID these species, we find a lot of other exciting things in our nets. And this is showing how not only are the nets supporting our key species, but the biodiversity and a a, of the whole area and the additional species. So you can see in some of these pictures, you can see decorator crabs, spiny lobster juveniles, other species of scallops. We have a swimming clam there, a little file fish, sea cucumbers, um, and a tiger uh, flatworm. So they're all different species, and that means that every single person that's out there going through these nets sees things that they probably have never seen before. There's nothing cooler than going through these and not knowing what you're going to find and come out with a lobster or a fish. We got baby hogfish the other day. So those are all different creatures that are sustaining themselves off of our nets. So now our ongoing methods, once we move them out of the spat size and into our grow out nets, we have these large lantern nets that are hanging in the water column. Um, so they go to about 10 feet tall when you spread them out. And we have them out on a small grow out line, which was mapped by our interns, which I'll show you. But every time we're looking at these nets, we're pulling them up, putting them on our wet bench. We record the date, the location of the net on our line so we can track them over time. And then we look at the number of each species that we're finding. We take a random men, um, sample of that and we measure them to see the actual size of those individuals. And then we clean up the net and put it back out. Now, this is the funnest part. This is where you're looking and having a scavenger hunt. But this is also where we need the most help. This is where seeing a thousand students a year is the most impactful because they are the ones that are helping us do all of this work. Um, these are our maps of where we currently are um, tracking these grow out nets around the island. Uh, this map was created by one of our uh, junior staff interns over the summer. So really letting them go out, dive these nets and work out, okay, if we're gonna collect data over this for a long time, how do we do that in a way that actually is meaningful? Letting them make mistakes, which as a master's in marine biology uh, person myself, is very hard to let them make the mistakes, but otherwise they don't learn. And I remember my mentors letting me learn through mistakes like this as well. So we have been produced with some beautiful maps and some really awesome data that is showing loads of fluctuations out there, but we are very much still in the pilot part of this study. We hope that this continues on with our 20 year lease of the island and we keep producing this data and seeing where the trends are. Majority right now, we're getting a lot of the Atlantic pearl oyster and we hope to see what else we find. So I hope you guys join us out there and I'm gonna pass on to Anne just about how all of this education kind of ties together. Hi everybody again, how are you doing? Um, so yeah, as an educator, I'm coming in um, and our, our main classification is using Bloom's taxonomy. Is there any educators in the audience? Anybody? Or at least all of us, thank you. Or at least all of us have been in, in school. So Bloom's taxonomy, excuse me, Bloom's taxonomy is a very useful classification of learning objectives. Um, it helps us decide whether the questions that we are asking of the objectives that we are seeking the children to participate in are of a good quality or not. So generally education is, is set up from the bottom up. You're doing the rote learning. You're learning to identify species, to explain things. And then you work towards the higher level thinking goals. Um, the wonderful thing about working outside is that you can set the higher level thinking questions first. So you could almost work from the top down. So you can ask the hard questions. Um, like, can you implement a survey technique for our, uh, our nets? Can you decide what's inside them? How do we assess what's in there? And um, the children could come and not actually know any of the, the things that they are identifying. They may not know what the species are, that we're going to accept, but that we're going to look for. But um, all we have to do is pull up the nets and let them see what's inside. So their excitement um, 
leads them into doing all these classifications and maybe thinking about the problems that they can solve. Um, so rather than being inside the classroom where you have to do the knowledge first and all that structured learning, you just really throw them in the deep end with the hard problems and then let them guide them, in fact, in, um, in solving those problems and coming up with different ways of thinking about an issue. The great thing is as well, we can just throw them in there and allow some of the children who have, or the students who have more experience, for instance, our interns, to guide them as well. So we just facilitate the hard questions that they need to solve and that they will be solving later on in life. Um, and then we allow them and the, the students who have more knowledge to guide them in finding out how to solve these problems. Um, these are some of our students. So uh, we've got some um, Youth Climate Summit students in the summit students in these pictures here, as Aaron and uh, Zara, uh, actually doing the the um, finding the species in the nets over there. So do, they're doing the sorting, and this is Gretchen as well. Gretchen is looking for a, a career in the boating industry, but she was also quite involved in sorting through the nets and seeing what's there. So um, the wonderful thing, again, is that the students are in it. They're seeing the connections. Most children don't have trouble talking about agriculture and solving problems to do with agriculture. So this facilitates them seeing that the same problems are there for mariculture and maybe some of the solutions that will help guide us into developing greater food sustainability, for instance. They then see the application there. It just makes it more uh, makes more sense. Okay, obviously that we're asking these higher order questions of them, and they're um, actually delving in, doing the hands-on approach of sorting, classifying, finding, and being excited about the things that they're finding. It's so much easier to engage them outside. Um, as well, it, it, I mentioned here tracking the development of projects. So we do have. Uh, students who come back year after year, season after season, and progress through their education. They progress through their um, application and their analysis. And those are the ones that are going to be coming back and, and um, showing us a better way to solve these problems with the nets. They're going to decide that we need to structure them in a different way or put them in a different place. They're going to have the ideas because they've seen from the beginning how... Um, how this project develops, and then they can spot our mistakes and improve on them. And really, that's what we're looking for. We're handing it over. This is what we're doing. This is the problem. How can you make it better? Um, and of course, just being outside and seeing it, actually being able to pull up the nets, being able to sort through the nets to see what is there promotes excitement. It means that we really don't have to work too hard to engage our students because it's right there. And um, yeah, and they can they can enjoy and wonder rather than being stuck inside four walls. Okay. Back to you, JP. I was thinking actually when Anne was saying that, that the, the last student who actually corrected me and said, I have a much better idea was your son, Max. <laughs> we, were, we were scuba diving on the nets and I was scrubbing away and Max said, JP, there's a much better. He actually said, let's go up. And, and took me up and said, there's a much better way to do this. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm very encouraged. I think we're all encouraged by the young people. They're great ideas and you give them free reign to think and they come up with wonderful ideas. Um, a few thank yous. So we've, um, we've really based all of this around the Bermuda Biodiversity Study and, uh, and project there. We visited with uh, Dr. Sarah Manuel, uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources a few times and just said, you know, is what we're doing going to sync up with the big the big picture objectives here. And she's given us the permits to actually do this and has guided us along the way, which is absolutely wonderful. And the best part, of course, is that the students then submit their data to her and it becomes part of the public record. And for them to realize that they're doing some real science is, is just groundbreaking. So it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd also like to thank um, someone you probably don't know, but John Roy. John runs um, an aquaculture school in New Haven, Connecticut. He has been to Bermuda numerous times. He's uh, a good friend and has come out to Bird Island, and he is 100% open source with all of his materials. He's been training teenagers to run a full aquaculture facility for 
I think about 20 years. He's given us his whole curriculum, all of the nets that you see, he sent down to us free of charge and just a wonderful supporter. And it's amazing to really see all of the expertise around the world and how so many people are pulling together to try to, to make this difference. Um, and with that in mind, I'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Samia. Um, Dr. Samia Sarkis has been a wonderful advisor along the way, the uh, self-proclaimed scallop lady. Has, uh, she, her PhD was actually how to raise scallops and she cracked the code and it's absolutely wonderful, a how-to guide for Bermuda. Um, and she has given us some incredible advice along the way. So uh, Samia and the Living Reefs Foundation have been huge supporters. And uh, just to pick on him as well, I just wanna say a big thank you to Ro Dr. Robbie, who's uh, um, with us today and has uh, been such a supporter, helped mentor me over the years and many of the, uh, the scientists in Bermuda here. Um, as a final thank you to uh, BUEI for, um, for this opportunity um, to Jessica and to uh, Carla and to Julie and to William um, for this opportunity to share um, and to all of you for coming out to, uh, to see this. It's, it's super exciting to have all of these young people engaged and I really feel the energy that it's building and uh, these young minds getting kind of exposed to this, this, these new ideas is, uh, is setting a very positive precedent for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Water, Water Start. That was absolutely fantastic. I'm sure a ton of us learned uh, a, a huge amount that we uh, didn't know before. Um, and I'd also like to uh, ask just before I pass over to the audience for some other questions, um, this, these opportunities that you put together aren't just for students, are they? Um, can you talk to us just for about like 30 seconds or so around uh, some of the other opportunities you put on for uh, older folks? So not only do we have our students out there, we also have our internship program. So that runs from people that are about 15 year, years old all the way up to students that are in university studying their masters and stuff like that. Um, the oldest student we have there is up to about 24 years old. And that's the really heavy science side where they can actually use that in their projects. But not only that, we have volunteer days where all of the general public can come out and see what we do on Burt Island. And we also host corporate days out on Burt Island. So we have had many this spring so far. We had 105 people out there recently helping us pull nets and look at everything. So really, every element of the community can is welcome to Burt and is welcome to try and help us along the way. Because really, it takes a village to do something like this, especially when you want people to care about it for a long time. So the more people that have their hands on it that see it, the more tangible it is, the more we're gonna continue it. So thank you, William, that's a really good point. Sorry, just to add one thing there as well, is that the most asked question when parents are dropping off their teenage children for us to take out is, when's my turn? Um, and you know, for, for older people to have the opportunity to do this is, uh, is something that we have to weave into our program. But as Phoebe says, a lot of the corporate groups um, have been coming out and that's been a game changer. This is very much a community-based um, endeavor. Um, Chubb, of course, a huge thank you for supporting uh, the BREI Talks. Um, and they're also uh, sponsors of Water Start. Um, our lead sponsor is Aspen and they have been absolutely game-changing in supporting us um, along with a, a lot of other partners. So, um, so a thank you to all of you and everyone who helps to make this happen. Wonderful question. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what about hurricanes? That's my biggest nightmare as well. Quite right. Um, this is a big part of the design of these systems is how do we make them hurricane proof? Um, for me, how do we make them on a day to day basis boat proof? We obviously don't want to tangle any propellers. Um, how do we make them so that um, some bigger animals don't get tangled? You know, it would be heartbreaking to see a large animal get tangled and and uh, you know, be damaged um, from the nets and so on. So there's a lot of design considerations. Um, currently what we're doing, and thank you for the question, it, it's perfect. We have our nets uh, situated right where the power cable comes in to Bird Island. And there's a very large sign that says no anchoring. So we're kind of tackling the boat problem by saying, let's get them you know, where no one is gonna pitch an anchor anyway. And the other thing that we do um, when uh, Brent Smith does his nets in Long Island Sound, the law there is that you can lease an area of the, the sea floor, the, what we call the queen's bottom, and I guess I should say the king's bottom right now. Um, but Bermuda's law is different. So you can put down a lobster pot, but you're not leasing the ocean floor. So he's able to lease an area and have surface lines and hang the nets down. What we're doing is the opposite, and we're actually putting them on the bottom 
and we get all of the styrofoam floats that wash up on South Shore beaches. So we go and save those, and we actually float the buoys up off the bottom. So at the moment, um, when was it Ian came through? Fiona. Um, they're all attached to the bottom. When the, the big storms come through, they just lie flat, and then they'll spring back up again. So, so far, that seems to be working. Um, they do get a little uh, more sediment at the bottom, so still trying to figure out the nuts and the bolts there. But definitely, Bermuda and aquaculture, we have to think of the weather and the ever-increasing number of storms um, as a big part of the design. That's a great question. Thank you. At the moment, we have them in about 20 feet of water with the top of the buoys about eight feet below the surface. And in that part, there are no boats that go through the draw more than about four or five feet. So we're well below the propeller danger zone, um, but also below the surface chop. The only, as I said, the only real issue is that by positioning them on the bottom there, they get fouled quite quickly and they do get more sediment than we'd like. So we're still trying to fine tune that. Ideally, a little deeper water would be better, um, but then that makes education a little trickier to get the students there. Please. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So the question is the situation with clams in Harrington Sound, and as you mean, the calico clams. Yeah, I remember as a kid being, we, we didn't collect them, but just to go and find them, the two little um, holes looking at the little filter holes. My, un yeah, <laughs> my understanding is that they are doing better. Um, we don't get into Harrington Sound very much um, for the simple reason that our boat doesn't fit under the bridge. So I am not as familiar. We did get to hang one of our spat collector nets in Harrington Sound. And, uh, and I think that's where we got some of our larger scallops because that's where Dr. Sarkis had her scallop nets. Um, hanging. Um, but no clams. We, uh, the clams definitely are in uh, sandy bottoms rather than seagrass bottoms or thick seagrass. I'm very pleased to say the seagrass around Bird Island is coming back. So it doesn't look like an ideal hab habitat for calico clams, but it would be wonderful to see those spread back again. But so so um, we're being recorded. So let me try to repeat your question back so that the, uh, the uh, the online folks can see that. But thank you so much, Dr. Robbie. That's a wonderful, um, wonderful uh, question. And certainly the next phase is something that we're, we're excited about. You know, phase one, this pilot program was, can we keep anything alive for a while? Um, and it seems so far that yes, we can, that's wonderful. Um, and I, I'm super excited for that next stage. So your question being, you know, can we uh, translocate these restored oysters and other species to places where they will thrive and that they will uh, produce the most good. And I think that's one for the, for the students to, to work on. And uh, you know, as much as I want to do that brain work, I'd love to have our students kind of brainstorm that and to take those projects um, to other locations. I think mangroves are an excellent idea for that. Um, and then other places where hopefully water needs restoring and they could be, uh, you know, have a restorative feature there. Um, your question also about Chris Evans' work and our awareness of that. Uh, Dr. Sammy has given me some details about that. We have a little bit of information there, but um, I think that is absolutely apropos. With our design, there's still um, elements that are missing, and lobsters um, are often a, an element, if you will, for the, the benthos for the bottom, and how can we weave that in? And uh, I know with Chris's work, finding the exact right niche for the little curly lobsters is actually, you know, you get the right size uh, hidey hole and you can get just thousands and thousands of lobsters. Um, we're trying to do the same, obviously, with the oysters and scallops. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's exciting. And I think um, what we probably need to do, maybe with one of our interns as well, is do a, a huge data crunch and get in all of the information and all of the papers to really look at the problem. Thank you very much. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, we certainly find, sorry, we certainly find lobsters in there now. So it is a stage in the future. Is there something about the particular nets that we are finding the lobsters in that is the right size, the right depth, the right closeness to shore that maybe we could replicate in the future to help promote that continuously with our nets? But it's always fun when you get to find a, a juvenile lobster in there and everyone lights up. So it's a good question. Yeah, I think a few of us can speak on. Uh, we do have lots of different. Um, types of students that come to the island. The students that are there specifically for our programs that we run and the training that we do, but also students from many local schools. So we have a partnership with SOLTIS, the Sustain Sustainable Islands um, Partnership, where we have students come out as a part of their curriculum 
to actually try and achieve some of those lesson plans and lesson objectives in the real world, seeing it in a slightly different way than normal. And we're hugely grateful for all of the efforts with a lot of the local public schools who have also been pushing more students towards field trips out there with us, getting more aware of the environment. Um, we have a very nice connection with uh, SANS uh, Middle School as well as Somerset Primary. But really, we actually see students from every school in Bermuda. And we also help support them with the financial aid that is necessary to allow them to do trips like this. And that's one of the aspects of the funding that you talk about. Not only do we fund for us being able to run these programs and all of these projects, we fund to make sure that no student is ever turned away due to their financial condition. So we do not turn away a student because they can't afford it. We believe that if someone is passionate, they should be given the chance. And our corporate donors are not only allowing us to do that, but also allow us to build some more state-of-the-art facilities to actually take us fully off-grid which is our part of our four-year strategic plan that we are really pushing now to take Burt Island's campus, which is a falling down building, and have that redone with an extra classroom, more staff, more boats, solar panels, so it's completely off-grid and really demonstrating what it would be like to live sustainably out there. So it is always hard to secure funding, but once people see it and understand the impact that it has and how much Bermuda needs that, I think we know we're just scratching the surface, but we really do passionately try for that in the whole community. Uh, a small amount of students from off island, typically in our summer and holiday programs, because that's not when they're in education elsewhere, but they are not our main demographic. No, currently not. And that is something that our partners, the island school, are doing that we have taken a lot of inspiration from and hopefully in the future we could offer more residential camps. Right now we have overnight camping just for one night in our programs. Sure, um, I'll just say a quick bit and then JP can speak. Quite a lot of the research that's going on about the sargassum, there was that breaking study that I remember being sent recently about these heavy metals. These are changes that are coming you know, coming to light now after being studied for quite a long time. And I think there are changes that are going to be continued to be seen in many aspects of our ecosystems. You know, if you've attended talks um, about plastic, we find microplastics now breaking into the food that we are eating and it's building up throughout the, the trophic systems and it is entering into our diets. It's something that we have to be aware of our impact in all of these aspects. You know, if the sargassum is a massive plant that is living in the water that we are polluting with heavy metals, we are going to have heavy metals in those plants as well. And I think JP will speak. Thanks, Phoebe. And again, just the, the great question about the, um, the uptake of uh, arsenic and I guess other persistent organic pesticides and so on. Um, it, it is. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, my first thought was, what a great project for a student to investigate, you know. Um, there's certainly, when we think about the, the shellfish, if at any point in the future there is a way that these will be back on a, a table, then water quality monitoring and studying the, the, the shellfish themselves and, and studying to make sure that they are healthy and looking at the, uh, the, the quality of soil in our organic garden and so on. All of these are absolutely necessary steps and wonderful scientific steps for students to take. So it is, it's an exciting project. Um, but I, I completely relate as well when, when we were able to visit the island school um, that Phoebe mentioned down in Eleuthera, I, I, I felt like they stole our Bermudian idea because they, uh, they also uh, harvest the sargassum and they put it around their fruit trees. But then they've added a cool element, which is that they have chickens that they have free range around as well. So the chickens then eat all the little bugs that are in the, uh, in the sargassum. And of course, as they poop, they manure the fruit trees as well. So they've got this whole ecosystem that's working very well and lots and lots of eggs. I have a wonderful picture of uh, Anne's daughter with a chicken on her head um, just after it laid an egg. So there's, yeah, there's all sorts of wonderful um, ways to kind of work that, that all out together. Um, but one of the cool things as well is that a lot of times the plants are actually mitigating that and have a, a means of breaking down some of the, the harmful chemicals. So a bit of bioremediation with plants. So to be investigated. The answer is yes, um, or Julie, do you want, it's on YouTube. So just to repeat that, on the BUEI uh, YouTube channel. Great, thank you, Julie. Thank you for the question. 
Wonderful question. So the, the question is, is there um, any archaeological treasures still on Bird Island following the, uh, the Boer War POW camp? Um, I guess you can define treasures in different way. We have a lot of the, uh, the kind of the wash stations, so the, the old concrete pads. Um, there's a few old fence posts for where they divided the island in half between officers and prisoners. Um, we still find occasional artifacts um, and uh, We've, uh, most of the wonderful artifacts that have been found there are already in museums. National Museum of Bermuda has some wonderful ones. We do occasionally turn up something. Uh, just recently, uh, one of our colleagues found a piece of bone that had beginning scrimshaw in it. Um, so a few things from that day, but it's begging for a little archeological dig out there and to see what else is there. I'd absolutely love to see that happen. And um, it's, it's one of the 300 different projects that we would hope to do out there, but I don't have time for it at the moment. But thank you, great question. Thank you very much, folks. I do hope you've really enjoyed uh, this afternoon's presentation and having a discussion with our folks from uh, Waterstart here. Um, once again, this, uh, the title of this uh, presentation series is Island SOS, uh, and we hope you guys will uh, join us again on the uh, first Sunday of uh, every month until uh, October. Um, once more, a big round of uh, applause for uh, the Waterstart crew if we can. And once more, extending our thanks to Chubb for their sponsorship of this series. I'm William Campbell, and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you so much.